Good evening, everyone. Erev Tov. Welcome to the Sun and the Scriptures this week as we continue our year-long journey through the Torah. Uh, the Torah's 54 divisions. We are in the book of Numbers, known as Bamidbar, in the wilderness in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, let's get started with the blessing before the study of Torah, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about where we're headed and get into the text. Let's pray. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech ve'elam. Asher kidishanu b'misvita v'sevanu le'asok b'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to be immersed into the words and the matters of Torah. Amen. So mentioned the Torah's 54 divisions. This is portion number 40. Uh, portion number 40, known as Balak, or in the Hebrew, Balak, uh, but we'll go with Balak, covers Numbers chapter 22, verse 2, and goes through chapter 25, verse 9. Uh, this week's portion uh, fits especially well with the theme that we are taking in this year's journey through the Torah, that is that focus of the sun and the scriptures, all the ways in which uh, the Torah portion for that week uh, either speaks to Messiah, uh, as we'll see, especially in this week's portion, uh, prophesies about Messiah, predicts Messiah, uh, but also different ways even the apostolic writers of the New Testament made use of the verses or the imagery of that week's portion in their writings. In other words, how does this week's portion connect to uh, our New Testament as followers of Jesus of Nazareth? Uh, and this week's portion really sets up well for that. It also sets up well uh, to once again, we've seen it before, but this is another portion where it kind of can be highlighted a little bit, and that is uh, the importance of the Targums. And again, just as a, a quick review before we get into it so that when we uh, read from the Targums this evening. We know what they are. The Targums are those Aramaic paraphrases, not translations, but paraphrases of the Old Testament. And they were primarily constructed around the first century, a little bit before. Uh, so they were known by Jesus. They were known by the apostles. But as uh, Hebrew became less the conversational language. It never ceased being the religious language, but it did cease being, especially in diaspora, but even uh, in more locales, even around the promised land, uh, Aramaic became the conversational language. And so when many people might be in a synagogue service and the Torah portions read in Hebrew, uh, they may not understand it. It would be similar in today's modern world if you went to a Catholic mass that was in Latin. You might be able to pick up pottery and be like, oh, that's potter, that's father, right? You might, in a, you know, in a very, invariably understand a few things, but you probably would not understand what was going on. Uh, and so after the Torah was read, someone would come forward and they would paraphrase, not translate, paraphrase, which meant it had interpretation built into it uh, of an Aramaic of what was just read in Hebrew. And so eventually this gets codified, i.e. written down. Uh, there are a few different Targums out there. Uh, there's Targum Yonatan is one of the more popular ones, the more widely circulated. There, there's Targum Yerushalmi, which we'll look at this evening. That's the ta Targum that was primarily used in the Jerusalem area. Um, but what it does is it will often, especially when it comes to things of Messiah, add interpretive aspects to it. So it's kind of like the earliest study Bible. But it's important for us uh, because we may think, well, we, why we need Targums, right? Because it lets us know the commentary that Jesus was hearing in the synagogue. It lets us know the commentary the apostles were hearing in the synagogue. It lets us know what, by the time of Jesus, was already understood to be messianic passages. And so it can't just be, we can't just look at a passage like we will tonight and go, oh, the Christians decided that was a passage about the Messiah. We'll find out, no, the Jewish people themselves, even before Jesus was incarnated in the flesh and born of the Virgin Mary, even 
even before that ever happened and there was ever even the notion of Christianity, these passages were understood to be messianic. Uh, and so they're, they're helpful in that way. They help us understand the historical understanding of passages. And so tonight, we'll see a couple of times where that becomes beneficial. Uh, because well, if you've ever even wondered, like in uh, the Gospel of Luke, the, the Christmas story, and how did these astrologers from the east, from essentially Babylon, why would they even be looking for a star to herald in the Jewish Messiah? Why would they even know about it? Much less, why would they even care about it? And the answer, actually, is in this week's portion, okay? So very significant in sun and scripture kind of things. All right, so let's kind of load up into our airplane, fly over 30,000 feet, and look at what's happening in portion uh, Balak, a summary of the portion. So there is the individual Balak, who the portion is named after. He is the king of Moab. And he summons a prophet, uh, but a Gentile prophet. In many ways, his name is Balaam, or that's what we're going to call him. His Hebrew name is a little more uh, pronounced differently, but Balaam. When you think of Balaam, I want you to think of the Gentile Moses, all right? So he's embodied with uh, he's with the spirit. He knows spiritual things. He has spiritual connections. He knows God and can have conversations with God, and God responds to him. But he is a Gentile. Uh, but he's also kind of a gun for hire. Uh, and so Balak, the king of Moab, summons this prophet Balaam to come and to curse the people of Israel. Because remember, from a Torah worldview, from a Hebraic worldview, from a, a biblical worldview, speech matters. Speech matters. Words create and destroy worlds. And so blessings, they're not just well wishes to someone. They affect things. And same with curses. Uh, it's not just like curses be you and so forth. And I just, I'm saying something negative about you, but it, it has effect especially if you truly know what you're doing with your words. And Balaam is this individual who's, who is known to possess this spiritual aspect. Uh, and so the king of Moab, Balak, wants a Balaam to curse Israel, to effect harm on Israel. And so uh, Balaam agrees to this, and on the way to the job, he is berated by his donkey. So this is the famous talking donkey story of the Bible. Uh, and this donkey uh, sees essentially God trying to communicate before Balaam does. Uh, but this donkey sees the angel of God that is sent to block Balaam's way. Three times from three different vantage points, Balaam attempts to pronounce his curses to affect his spiritual negativity upon the people of Israel. But each time that he tries to issue forth a curse, what ends up coming out of his mouth are blessings instead. Uh, and again, words matter. And so his blessings also affect their results, which end up being positive for the people of Israel. And this isn't very much what the king of Moab, Balak, was wanting. Uh, along the way, Balaam also ends up prophesying about the end of days and about the coming of the Messiah. And so after three times of trying to curse and failing but end up blessing, Balaam knows how to get the people of Israel. He's, he basically says, look, we're not going to get them with me cursing them. We're not going to get them through spiritual means, but we can get them through our women. We can get them by tempting them. And so the people of Israel fall prey to the charms, as it says in the text, the charms of the daughters of Moab. And in the process, in the Bible, whenever uh, the people of God are enticed uh, sexually and so forth by uh, other nations, it isn't just that. It also implies that they took upon themselves their gods, their worship, uh, that they 
were synchronistic, not only in just kind of going outside of someone in their religion or their faith, but also kind of accepted and embraced the culture. Uh, it's that kind of not only physical kind of adultery, but the spiritual kind as well. And so they were enticed to the worship of the idol Peor. Uh, when a high-ranking Israelite official publicly takes a Midianite princess into his tent and essentially to become his wife, um, there is an individual known as Pincus. A lot of English translations have his name as Phineas, but his Hebrew name is Pincus. Um, he ends up killing both of these individuals and stopping a plague that was raging among the people because of their disconnection. Okay, so that's the summary of the portion. So what we want to do now is put on our sun and scripture lenses and look at some different ways in which this week's portion reflects and, um, as I said, and really prophesies or predicts, uh, describes aspects of the Messiah. And as we'll see, these aren't just Christian interpretations looking back, uh, though at times there's nothing wrong with that either, but it's important to also know that it, it really isn't that, but rather it is the fulfilling of the true understanding of Scripture that God's people have always had about these words in this week's portion. So with that, let's look at Balak, Numbers chapter 22. Uh, verses 4 and 5, and it says, And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of Moab at that time. So Moses and the children of Israel, again, are, are needing to move into the promised land. Moab, you can think essentially modern-day Jordan. So, I mean, they're right there on the border of the promised land. And Moses and the children of Israel have no interest in taking over Moab, have no interest in fighting Moab. They basically want to just cut through. It's like some kids in your neighborhood, and they're like, can we just kind of cut through your backyard to get to our friend's house, right? And you can be the grumpy old man that's like, get off my lawn, or perhaps you know the kids, and you can be fine. Just cut through, you know, just... That's all they were wanting to do. But Balak doesn't like that. And so he wants to take care of Moses and these individuals who are now essentially entering into his territory. And so then it says, So he, Balak, the king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor. So as we've mentioned, this week's Torah portion is named after Balak, this king of the Moabites, who has hired the prophet Balaam to place a curse upon Israel. Balak, king of Moab, ascended the heights of Moab, ascended to the high places to get a good view of everything. And he looked down upon the host of Israel spread out in the plains before him. And very similar to what the Egyptians began to feel, uh, that these Hebrew people are quite numerous, uh, could pose a problem. He looks out and it's like, yeah, this isn't good. They look like they might, they might even outnumber us. Uh, I can't in good conscience trust that this is neutral. All right. And so... Um, uh, he, he feels overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of the Hebrews that he sees. Uh, and already, uh, the Hebrews have gotten a reputation in the wilderness. They've proven their military prowess by defeating not only way back when the Egyptians, but also along the way, individual nations and uh, clans such as the Amorites. And so um, Balak knows, like, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people with the military. It's a lot of people that are well-trained. It's a lot of people that have a qualified leader. Uh, and so what is worse, it was said that for Balak's perspective, that their God is traveling with them in the midst of their camp. Uh, that's a big deal from the context, all right, that the Israelite God travels with them. Because in the ancient Near East at that time, the common belief was is that gods were territorial. 
And so like there might be a God of Macomb and he's powerful in Macomb. And if you live in Macomb, you better pay homage to the God of Macomb and you better pay respect to the God of Macomb and your place of worship better have an altar to the God of Macomb. But you know, this God of Macomb, he, he, he doesn't do a whole lot for you in Detroit right? There's the God of Detroit there. And if you go to Detroit, you better be prepared to pay homage to the God of Detroit and so forth, that they were territorial. And then, of course, if you defeated someone, that meant that you acquired their God in your favor. And so the fact that Israel, as the text describes them, has the reputation that with the tabernacle, that their God travels with them. They aren't limited by territory. The power that they receive from their God isn't limited just to Canaan or isn't just limited to the Upper Sinai Peninsula, but it's wherever they're at, they have connection to their God. So that's daunting uh, for Balak. Uh, so the tr- but the truth is, is Balak did not have to to worry. Again, the Israelites were only passing through, no intention of making war with the Moabites. But Balak doesn't really want to investigate this or find the intentions of Moses. As we've seen in the Torah elsewhere, um, when Moses wants to pass through, he'll ask for permission, he'll give his word, he'll sign a covenant, a treaty, he'll say, look, we're just passing through, we won't even drink your water, we won't use your resources, we just need to get from A to B, and you're in the middle of A and B. But Balak doesn't engage any of that. He only looks out and sees all of these Hebrews. And so Balak decides he would need supernatural help to defeat Israel. After all, Israel's God's traveling with them. And so he needs to fight spirit with spirit. And so he sends emissaries to essentially Mesopotamia to summon a world-renowned prophet and sorcerer, Balaam. He hoped to hire him to place a devastating curse upon the Israelites, something like a plague or mass insanity or perhaps civil war and the people turning on themselves. This is what Balak is envisioning. Balaam was eager to participate. But before he could set out for Moab, God warned him against the idea. So this gives some validity to the fact that uh, Balak wasn't a con man. That uh, even if we think of it as the dark side, you know, Star Wars analogy, he's a Sith and not a Jedi. He still knows the force and he knows how to use it and he's tapped into it and he knows how to have communication with the one true God. And God communicates with him and basically says, yeah, this isn't a good idea for you to do this. And when King Balak heard that Balaam had not done what he agreed to do, He supposed that the prophet was holding out for a better offer. And so he sent dignitaries with a promise of just enormous compensation. And Balaam then begs God. Balaam begs God for permission to go on the mission. So Balaam even understands the authority of this God, that he can't do anything without his permission. The Lord actually relents, but this is one of those when the Lord relents the much the way he did with Pharaoh or the way he will do in the future with Babylon and Assyria. It's always so that his glory might be made manifest, but he relents and he allows Balaam to go, but warns him, do not attempt to place a curse on Israel. So God says, you can go, but don't place a curse on Israel. Balaam headed out for Moab, fully intent on placing a curse on Israel and earning a large reward from King Balak. While Balaam was on the way, the angel of the Lord intercepted him, not once, not twice, but three times. The Bible loves to do things in patterns of three. Always look for that when you're reading the Bible. Uh, And so the angel of the Lord intercepts him, in a form visible only at that time to Balaam's donkey, which was really illustrating how this renowned prophet's uh, spiritual view had now become blinded, that it was a donkey who could see more clearly than he could. And so on arriving in Moab, Balaam attempts to curse Israel three times. There's that pattern of three that the Bible loves. And each time the Lord turned the curse 
into a blessing. Balaam meant to say one thing, and yet, lo and behold, when he said it, what he heard was something completely different. Instead of a curse, it was a blessing. He involuntarily spoke prophetical, prophetic oracles of blessing over Israel. And the oracles of Balaam offer several glimpses into the Messiah. Uh, great, great for us in Son in the Scriptures. And Jewish sources, again, such as the Targums and the Midrash, agree on many of the prophecies of Balaam pointing towards the coming of Messiah. So let's look at these. Uh, the first one, uh, it's in Numbers 23, verse 10. Who can count the dust of Jacob? So remember, this would be coming from a high up on a mountain, looking down on Israel encamped, right, in their formation that looks like a cross with the tabernacle and the presence of God kind of in their center. It looks like dust, the sand of the, on the seashore, right? The promises given to Abraham. Who can count the dust of Jacob? Who can count all of these people? Or number the fourth part of Israel. Like, this is insane. Like, how many people there are? Let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like his. And so he was meaning to curse, and yet these words come out. What do these words mean? So again, King Balak hired Balaam to pronounce terrible curses over Israel that would result in some kind of awful, horrid death or chaos for them. Uh, again, Balak's uh, anticipating things like a plague, uh, sickness, including like other times things like this have happened in the Bible. Everyone gets a massive case of, of diarrhea and so forth, and they're just incapacitated, and then you can plow over them physically. Uh, he envisions something like that, a, a swarm of bees coming and stinging everybody, but something grand like that. So imagine his disappointment when instead Balaam declares not a curse, but he says, let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like his. So rather than pronounce a, a nasty, horrible death for Israel, Balaam wistfully remarked that he wished that his very own death would be comparable to that of the upright of Israel, the Zadokim, the, the Kassadim, the, the righteous of Israel, that he wishes he could be counted among them. And in expressing this sentiment, he uses two terms. The first is plural, upright ones. And the second is singular, his. So it kind of reads like this. Let me die the death of the upright ones, plural, and let my end be like his, singular. So it's talking about two different things here. It looks at first, if you don't know the singular plural aspect in the Hebrew, that it's just kind of parallelism, but it's not parallelism. Let me die the death of the upright ones, plural. Let my end be like his, singular. Balaam prophetically sees that he has no power to curse Israel because their fate is in God's hand. As Psalm 116 verse 15 says, precious in the sight of the Lord, is the death of his upright ones. And similarly, Jesus tells his disciples not to fear death because their lives are in God's hand. So Luke chapter 12, uh, verse 6 and 7, are not five sparrows sold for two cents, yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, you are more valuable than many sparrows. Or Jesus again in Matthew 10, not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Balaam uses the singular masculine pronoun when he says, let my end be like his. We interpret this singular pronoun to refer to none other than the Messiah, the singular seed of Israel. Looking to Messiah who overcame death and rose from the tomb, we should all exclaim, let my end be like his, for the curse of death cannot overcome the people of God. So Balaam realizes that, that though I tried to curse you with death, I cannot because he has overcome death. May my end be like his. And we think about 
what was Messiah's death like? Well, it ended up coming back in resurrection and life eternal. Shout for the king. Numbers 23, verse 21. Again, Balaam says, okay, well, I tried to curse. This weird thing came out about, I want to be like one of the righteous people of Israel, and I want my death to be like the Messiah where it ends in resurrection and eternal life. Let me try that again. And so he goes to curse again. And he says, he has not observed misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. So King Balak retained Balaam to curse Israel with misfortune and sorrow even after the first failure. In his second attempt to curse Israel, Balaam exclaimed that he saw no misfortune, that he saw no trouble in store for Israel. So when he goes to curse them, he ends up saying, there's nothing bad for you in your future. I see nothing negative coming for you. Instead, they were blessed because the Lord, his God, is with him. And Balaam went on to say, the shout of a king is among them. The word translated as shout is actually the Hebrew word teruah, T-E-R-U-A-H, teruah. It is the same word commonly used as one of the notes played in a shofar blast. Therefore, the line could be translated as the trumpet blast of the king is among them. The Apostle Paul mentions the shout, literally the teruah of the Messiah's trumpet when he says in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. And believers know that the king's shofar blast is none other than the trumpet of the Messiah. He is the coming king. And here is where the Aramaic Targum helps us, that this isn't just me going to be looking where I'll look into places like Revelation and find these connections, though we can and we will and we do, but that this was understood even pre-Christian era, right? The Targum Yonatan, so... If you have your Bible with you, turn it to Numbers 23, verse 21. And it doesn't matter what translation you have. Just have it there. Kind of look over it. And then I want to, so imagine that would be what would be read in Hebrew in the synagogue. Whatever your translation is for Numbers 23, 21. Then an individual would come up and go, for those of you who don't speak that language, let me tell you what it said. And this is what the Targum says. Numbers 23, verse 21 says, The word of the Lord their God is their help, and the trumpets of the King Messiah resound among them. Now, if you look at your Numbers 23, 21, it doesn't say that, does it? But remember, the Targums aren't translations. They're paraphrases. But they are the paraphrases that shaped Jesus when he was a little boy going to synagogue, the apostles when they were learning the faith, they, when they were teaching in the synagogues, when Jesus went to a synagogue, or the apostles went to the synagogue, and this portion was read. This is what the people were told that portion meant, that it was a messianic portion. So that informs us, therefore, oh, well, this is talking about the trumpet of Messiah and the resounding shout of the Messiah. Wow, and like we can find that in Paul. We can find that in John. We can find where the apostles made that connection. Why did they make the connection? Because they knew the Targum. That's how they made the connection. It wasn't like they were just creative people making connections no one had ever heard of or that they were just sitting down with pen and paper and just all of a sudden filled with the Holy Spirit and came up with this translation or interpretation no one's ever heard of. Quite the opposite. They were rooted in their tradition. And Jesus doesn't just fulfill the, the, the pages of the Old Testament. He fulfills the oral tradition as well. And so uh, the Targum does not translate the passage to say the trumpet of the King Messiah will resound among them. It says the trumpet of King Messiah, that it is resounding or that they are resounding among them, even us now. 
And though we have not yet heard the final show for our blast that will herald the final coming and advent of our King Messiah, his trumpets indeed are already sounding and resounding in our midst. Each time we blow the shofar on the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, every fall, we are rehearsing the day of his coming. And we may not yet hear the final trump of Messiah, but the unseen world of spiritual darkness most certainly does. When Balaam attempted to curse the people of God, he heard the deafening blast of the Messiah. He heard the Messiah's blast for his arrival. So take courage. The trumpet of King Messiah resounds in our midst. The lion. Numbers chapter 23, verse 24. It says, again, the first two times didn't work. Let's try it one more time. And maybe, you know, from King Balak's perspective, maybe Balaam's just trying to drive up his price, right? Uh, negotiating. So the first two times he doesn't curse, but he blesses. And so now Balak's got to pay more, got to come through this third time. So Balaam, standing, looking over the people of Israel, goes to pronounce his curse. And he says, Behold, a people rises like a lioness, and as a lion it lifts itself. It will not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. It's probably not what Balak wanted to hear. But Balaam here is comparing Israel to a lion rising to do battle and resting after the kill. Well, who do you think, if you're Balak, the kill is going to be? And in Genesis 49, verse 9, Judah has already been compared to a lion, and his enemies were compared to the lion's slain prey. This is Genesis 49, verse 9. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who dares to rouse him up? The preeminent Torah commentator Rashi in his Kumesh explains the lion prophecies as referring to the errors, uh, errors of King David and King Solomon, which in and of themselves are prototypes and foreshadowings of the kingdom of Messiah. The lion tearing the prey, according to Rashi, is prophetic of King David who made war on Israel's enemies and subdued them. And the lion lying down to rest, according to Rashi, is the prophetic days of King David's son, King Solomon, who enjoyed an era of peace and prosperity. But we can also see them as the first and the second advent of Messiah and the different roles that are played in each of those comings. But when Messiah, the son of David, comes, he will defeat the enemies of Israel. And the total conquest will result in an era of peace, which no nation will dare rise up against Israel again. The people of Israel will enjoy a time of unparalleled peace and prosperity, what we would call the Messianic era, the Messianic kingdom in its fullness. And then the Messiah is the conquering hero who defeats all of God's enemies and so Messiah receives the title, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. Stop weeping and behold the Lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, who has overcome. Water from his buckets. Numbers 24-7. It's also an astrological sign that has some water in the buckets. Different discussion, different time. Numbers 24, verse 7. Water will flow from his buckets, and his seed will be by many waters. Balaam declared that water will flow from the buckets of Israel, implying an abundant water supply. He said that the seed of Israel will be planted by many waters, again forecasting ample supply for the agricultural success of Israel which whenever Israel is having agricultural success, as we've now been moving through the Torah and, and getting us ready for what will be coming in Deuteronomy, when there's agricultural success, what's that implying about the people and their relationship with God? 
but that is strong, right? That's the direct connection the Torah always wants to make. But when we consider this with sun and scripture eyes, with the messianic perspective, the prophecy reminds us of Jesus' words when he is at the holy temple, at the water libation ceremony that's being poured out on the altar in John chapter 7. Beginning in verse 37, Jesus says, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Messiah is the seed of Israel. We've talked about that word seed, Zarah, many times, not only in Son and Scriptures, but also in Echoes of Eden. And he is planted by many waters. Psalm 1, he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water that will yield its fruit in season. Its leaf will not wither, and whatever he does, it will prosper. Balaam continues, and he says these words, Numbers 24, verse 7. And his king, Israel's king, Israel doesn't have a king right at this time, so he's speaking, he's seeing something no one else is seeing. It's prophetic. We're going to see this more and more. Again, what we're doing is letting these Targums kind of be our first study Bible, right? This is the way we know. We know historically, not just a hunch. We know historically that these are the very things that shaped the understanding of the first apostolic community and before. This is what the Jewish people were expecting uh, these scriptures to be talking about. And so it helps us understand that what's being compared here is he will be greater than Agag. It's taking it back to a comparison to Israel's first king, Saul. So traditional Jewish interpretation regards Agag, the Amalekite king, as the father of the Agites. The book of Esther describes the villain Haman as an Agite. Therefore, the Amalekites and the Agites became prototypical, kind of synonymous a term that really would mean what we would use in our language as anti-Semitic. People who hated Jews, people who hated Israel, people who hated the people of God simply because they hated them. Therefore, in modern Hebrew terminology, Nazis are spoken of in Hebrew literature as Amalekites. And we might understand this prophecy to say that King Messiah will rise greater than any of the anti-Semitic forces of the world. Any force that is moving against the people of God, seeking to destroy them, like Balak was, like Balaam, uh, Balak and Balaam were, that they would invent, eventually meet defeat because God's king, the Messiah, would rise above it. As the prophet Balaam looked into the future of Israel and her enemies, he saw the final demise of the Amalekites, and he declared in Numbers 24, verse 20, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his end shall be destruction. So what does Balaam mean by saying Amalek was the first of the nations? Amalek is not the first of the nations. The Amalekites are descendants of Esau. They are a branch of the Edomites. The Jerusalem Targum explains that the Amalekites are called the first of the nations because they were the first to attack Israel after the Israelites left Egypt. After that incident, Moses declared, Exodus 17, verse 16, the Lord has sworn, I, the Lord, will wage war against Amalek from generation to generation. This implies that the war against Amalek, the anti-Semites of the world, will continue in every generation until the final days of the Messiah. So here is the Targum on Numbers 24, verse 20. So again, you can look in your Bible, you can look at what it says, and then this is how the Targum interpreted. The first nations who made war with the house of Israel were those of the house of Amalek. And they at last in the days of King Messiah, with all the children of the east, will make war against Israel. 
but all of them together will have eternal destruction in their end. The exalted kingdom. It says of this king, King Messiah, his kingdom shall be exalted. So Balaam declares that the kingdom of the coming king is going to be exalted, and that coming king is the Messiah. The kingdom of Messiah is the kingdom of Israel, which is the kingdom of heaven. The prophecy of the exaltation of the kingdom is first fulfilled in the days of King David. First Chronicles 14 verse 2 says, David realized that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that his kingdom was, quote, highly exalted for the sake of his people Israel. When the king is highly exalted, the kingdom is exalted. And so Balaam's prophecy uh, is of an exalted kingdom that is ultimately fulfilled in none other than King Messiah when he brings his kingdom. For King Messiah is the one, as the New Testament describes, that God is highly exalted, exalted above the heavens. He is the one to whom God exalted to his right hand as prince and savior to grant repentance and forgiveness of sins. Acts chapter 5. Verse 31. And then one of the more famous passages in uh, this week's portion that is heavily messianic and very much Christmas related. And that is the star in the east. Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. Balaam is in a prophetic trance. He's in a prophetic state. He is seeing what no one else is seeing. And this is what he is describing as he is seeing in his prophetic vision. I see him, but not now. In other words, he's seeing something that's coming in the future. It's not happening right there, but he he sees it. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down all the sons of Sheth. Rabbi Akiva was one of many who understood Numbers 24 verse 17 to refer to the promised Messiah King. Daniel the prophet also read this verse as referring to the Messiah. We know that the prophet Daniel studied the prophecies of the Torah. It specifically says that in the book of Daniel. And in fact, it talks about him even studying the prophecies of Jeremiah even. Daniel paid careful attention to prophecy and the prophetic writings of the Holy Scriptures. And he was particularly concerned with prophecies that might have some bearing on the exile that he and the Judean people were enduring in his lifetime. In other words, Daniel began thinking, maybe this is the time of Messiah. Maybe I'm living in the end times. And so he goes back in the book of Daniel and he looks at all of the prophecies And he begins to study them, and he begins to try to understand them, and he comes up with his own messianic prophecies. But recall that in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, Daniel speaks of studying again prophecies like that of Jeremiah, and the prophecies of Balaam are some of the most sweeping prophecies of the Torah, and they do speak of the exile. They speak of the Assyrian deportations, and they speak about a time when great world powers will come and dislodge God's people. And so, Daniel would have paid special attention to these. For example, in Numbers chapter 24, verse 24, Balaam prophesied about ships coming from Kittim. When Daniel spoke about the fleets of Rome in Daniel 11, verse 30, he referred to them as the ships from Kittim, a direct allusion to Balaam's prophecy, and again showing us that Daniel is interacting with Numbers 24. And therefore, we can surmise that Daniel studied these prophecies of Balaam very well. And he would have studied these prophecies in regard to the coming of Messiah. Perhaps he understood the prophecy of the star rising out of Jacob as an indication 
of the coming of Messiah. Now keep in mind, Daniel was regarded as the head of the wise men in Babylon. Right? The very people that are described as coming to the birth of Jesus, way back, Daniel was the head of those guys. Daniel studied Chaldean and Babylonian literature, the wisdom literature of Babylon, including astrology. When the Persians toppled the Babylonians, Daniel then rose up in Darius the Persian's court in the same manner. Daniel was renowned as an interpreter of visions, dreams, and prophecies. So, his studies of Torah while in exile in Babylon and Persia, Daniel reads Balaam's prophecy of the star. And he reads it literally to indicate that in the future, the sign of Messiah would be shown in the stars, that a single star would one day herald the advent of King Messiah. Not in Daniel's lifetime and not in his days, as the Torah says of even Balaam. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. But one day, through a star, it would herald Messiah. Daniel earnestly sought after insight into the future with prayer, with fasting, until the angel Gabriel comes to him and speaks to him and reveals to him the end of days. Daniel 12, verse 13. Gabriel told Daniel that he would not live to see the time of Messiah. But as for you, go your way to the end, then you will enter your rest and rise again for your allotted portion. The angel told him then to conceal these words and seal them up in a book for the end of time. This indicates that he was to leave some record for the generations that would follow him. And of course, he did. He leaves us the book of Daniel. But might there have been something more? Might he have left something for those wise men of Babylon and Persia? Remember, Daniel is skilled in astrology. He's the chief astrologer of Babylon and then Persia. In other words, he trains their astrologers. What if he encoded in their tradition? The very fact that the king of the Jews would be heralded by a star. After all, why else were there magi from the east watching for a star that would herald the coming king of the Jews? Why would they even care about that? Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. In the first century, King Herod, wanting to be king of the Jews, was never being, going to be accepted by the Jewish people because he wasn't to be king of the Jews. He wasn't Jewish. So King Herod decided, well, I need to eliminate all possible candidates. So he began exterminating anyone in the line from Judah in the line of David to try to eliminate his competition. Bethlehem's a key place to look for that. So all of the people, they're known as the disponi, the people of David said, we've got to get out of town. And they went to the North Galilee region out of Herod's jurisdiction. They established for themselves three cities. Three cities where the Disposini, the descendants of King David, lived in the first century. And they named their three cities Bethlehem, for obvious reasons. They left Bethlehem of Judea. They now have a Bethlehem in Galilee that Herod can't touch. They named their other city Sticktown. Nazareth, because of the prophecy that he would be a stick, a stump, a shoot from Jesse. And they named the third town Kokhba, Star Town, based on Numbers 24 17. And these three towns are right by one another. And that is where, of course, where is our Messiah? Where is he? Where does he really, where does the scriptures declare he's from? Yes, he's born in Bethlehem, but where is he from? 
Nazareth, Stick Town, where they went to be out of Herod's jurisdiction. All right. So even the naming of these new cities in the first century show this understanding that Messiah would be heralded by a star because they were anticipating that Messiah would come in the first century and that he would be born or from one of those three towns. Okay, so again, that's oral tradition. It's another way Jesus fulfills the oral tradition. And those three towns still exist today. All right, making it personal. Always like to begin with a story in this section and then kind of looking at a way that this week's portion gives us some application for our lives this week. So the story. Christmas was approaching, and the first grade teacher wanted to give his class a fun assignment. He asked his students to draw a picture of something they were thankful for, and at the end, in the end, they would hang them all together on the wall in some type of collage. Most of the students drew Christmas-related images, but Jacob drew a different kind of picture because Jacob was a different kind of boy. He came from a disadvantaged family, he struggled in school, and he had trouble making friends. As the other children played, Jacob was likely to stay back and stand by his teacher's side. Jacob's picture was simply the outline of a hand, just an empty hand, nothing else. Jacob's abstract image captured the imagination of his peers. Whose hand could it be? One child guessed that it was Jacob's own hand. Another suggested it was a police officer's hand because the police protect and care for people. Others suggested it was the hand of God because God cares for people. And on and on the discussion went. When the children finally moved on to other assignments, the teacher paused at Jacob's desk, bent down and asked, whose hand was it? The little boy looked away and whispered, it's yours. He recalled the times he had taken Jacob's hand and walked with him here or there. How often he had said, take my hand, Jacob, we're going outside, or let me show you how to hold your pencil, or let's do this together. And Jacob was most thankful for his teacher's hand. Brushing aside a tear, the teacher went on with class, touched by Jacob's gratitude. A hallmark of the Torah worldview, uh, to take seriously the worldview the Torah would ask us to have. A hallmark of that is the myriad of blessings that are intertwined in the fabric of daily living. So for those who follow a, a Torah-based lifestyle, it is common practice to verbally say a minimum of 100 blessings a day. 100 blessings a day, a minimum. And these blessings go through the whole fabric of life. From the moment we wake up, when we say, to when we fall asleep, in the closing of our eyelids, there are blessings to recite. There are blessings for every imaginable aspect of life. Blessings before and after eating. Blessings before, after, during worship. Blessings even after going to the bathroom. And blessing God that nothing was plugged. Every milestone of life is accompanied by a unique blessing as well. Every time you hear thunder, see lightning, see a rainbow, every time you hear good news or bad news, every time you see something magnificent, something tragic, something sad, something exciting, every time you take an orange or an apple, every time you pretty much do anything, there is literally a prescribed blessing for it. It's always short. Always begins with Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Elam. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the Universe. And then a short sentence of what you are blessing God of heaven and earth for. From the birth of a child 
to the mark of marriage, to even death itself. Life's milestones are marked and elevated through the practice, the very mindful, intentional practice of blessing. One of the reasons for this is because the, ble- the word for blessing actually con- connotes the idea of expansion. Expansion. So if you take an orange and you say, Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Borei Pari Ha'etz. That's the blessing before you eat an orange. Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the tree. What you're really saying, yes, you're acknowledging God is the creator of it and, the, and behind the goodness of it, but you're praying that what's good in that orange and what's good in that orange for you, that it would expand, that it would increase. Blessing is associated with expansion, with increasing In this week's portion of Balak, Balaam is hired by Balak to curse God's people, and he attempts to do so, but instead he gives blessing, increase. On the surface level, it is clear that blessings reflect a positive force while curses reflect the opposite. However, there are layers of depth beneath the surface. I want to give you one more layer of depth in addition to the idea that blessing God is increasing and expanding the goodness of God. But God is infinite beyond physicality, unrestricted by time and space. And the practice of blessing embodies the transition from infinite oneness to what I would call particular two-ness. The process by which God's divine energy, his shefa, flows into this world. The Hebrew letter uh, Aleph, the first letter, begins the name for God in Hebrew, El or Elohim. It's one. It represents a oneness, uh, uh, infiniteness, uh, infinity. But the Hebrew word, and remember words are never just words, the Hebrew word for blessing is Beracha begins with the letter bait, which is two. But even when we break down the spelling of the root word for beracha, bait, its numerical value is two. Resh, the R, its numerical value is 200. And chaf, its numerical value is 20. So two, 200, and 20, all twos. And when you add them up, what is it? Two, 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 right? So blessing in Hebrew is two, two, two. The letter bait, the word beracha, reflects the process of the aleph, God's oneness, becoming expressed into the physical world. So when we recite blessings and we say, Baruch Ata Adonai, or blessed are you, Lord, we're really not blessing God per se. We are, but we're doing more. There are two simultaneous intentions we must have. To acknowledge God as the source of the blessing, the abundance, the goodness in the world, and to ask God to continue to abundantly manifest in the world and our personal lives. God can only flow into the spare that you allow for him. And blessings create, increase, expand the space for which you can allow God to fill. Offering blessings for nearly every conceivable thing helps in the work of negating our ego, and it helps us make space for God in our lives. Curses are the exact opposite. Curses are limitations. They constrict God's flow into this world, and they replace abundance with boundaries. A curse is the attempt to to limit God's manifestation. So Balaam attempted to curse the people, to cut off their spiritual connection with God, to constrict it. But God flipped it, and Balaam did not negate, but instead he expanded. So this week, I would encourage you to make a habit of blessing. Acknowledge God as the source of blessing, abundance, and goodness, 
But another way for you to look at this, to kind of put it in more modern language, begin the practice of practicing an intentional life of gratitude, where such gratitude is audibly spoken. Be mindful, intentional with gratitude for everything, even the small things. You decide you need to go to Costco on Saturday morning. Don't advise you doing that, but you decide to do that, and you get a front row parking spot. Baruch Ata Adonai, not in a taking in the name in vain or using it uselessly, but with intention. Blessed are you, Lord God, who has created this very fortuitous space for me. When you barely miss a car wreck, when you see a beautiful sky, when you walk outside and you are enjoying the warmth of the sun, when you smell rain, when you hear good news from a friend, when you hear bad news from a friend. You have Job. Job, what is, Job blesses God. Blessed be God, the one who gives and the one who takes away. But blessed be the name of God, right? So even in those difficult times, we have Baruch Ata Adonai Da'an Ha'emet. You are the true judge. I don't understand it, but you're the true judge in this. So you will handle this, right? So even things you don't understand or comprehend, there are blessings for. But you would be amazed that if you commit to doing 100 of these a day, how it changes your attitude. It changes your perspective. It changes your heart. And it creates space for God in your life in places that previously there was no space. It will affect your relationship with God in a very real, tangible, practical way. The power of blessing. The power of blessing. The power of twos. All right. We will close there for this evening. Uh, again, uh, perhaps those that are listening online, there was a five-minute silence. It was the best best five minutes you'll ever, you know, too bad you weren't here for it, right? Uh, the people here will vouch for it. I revealed great deep secrets never before heard, you know. Um, but uh, hopefully the majority is there for us. Uh, intention and plan is to meet again, same place, same time next week. Let us close with the blessing. Baruch ata Adonai notein hatara. Blessed are you, Lord God, who has given to us the gift of the Torah. Amen. Go in peace, serve our Lord. Shalom, shalom. Hi, everyone. Thank you for engaging this teaching. You know, we at Emmanuel have as one of our goals to make our teachings available online to anyone, everywhere, at any time, whether that's through a podcast or our YouTube channel or an MP3 download. It is our gift to you, and we want you to use it however you see fit. Also, if you feel uh, motivated or desire to support future teachings, you can do so with the donate button at the bottom of our teaching page. That's found at immlutheran.org forward slash teaching. Again, thank you for participating in our teachings here and hope to see you or engage with you somehow, some way, somewhere. God bless.